advantages to the overall well-being of your city? Few of us probably have, but there's an entire industry around smart and sustainable parking solutions. I'm Chad Vanderveen, editor of Future Structure. Part of our editorial mission is to explain the concept of the city as a system and to tell the stories of not only what cities build, but how things are built and how the things cities build connect with everything else. As it turns out, parking is connected in some way to every facet of the city. Water, waste, energy, and transportation are factors of a sustainable parking system. I spoke to Rachel Yoka, Vice President of Strategic Business Planning and Sustainability at Tim Haas, a Philadelphia engineering and architectural design firm that specializes in developing unique and effective parking strategies for vibrant and sustainable communities. Rachel is also the editor of a new book called Sustainable Parking Design and Management. Smart cities, she explained, in many ways start with where you park. The book is really not covering necessarily new territory. Um, sustainability is not new to the parking industry. Parking professionals have been talking about how to green the industry for a very long time. Um, in 2008, we formed the IPI, um, formed their first sustainability committee. Um, we adopted a sustainability framework in 2010, um, and we actually updated that in 2014. So this is something that has been at the forefront of our industry. Um, what's different about the book in particular is that it's taking best practices and some real-world case studies and creating essentially a technical manual um, so that it's not just for experts on sustainability um, who go out and talk about these things and care deeply about them, but for every parking professional in the field who runs maybe parking on Cornell's campus or who runs a downtown parking garage, what can I do to make my existing infrastructure more sustainable and what can I do to plan more sustainable infrastructure in the future based on their parking operation? Essentially, it's, it's taking what is often seen as just part of the problem. Parking is often, you know, personified as a key problem in the sustainability world um, and making it part of the solution because the reality is that parking garages and parking spaces aren't going anywhere for the foreseeable future. So it's about making them a more elegant part of the solution. And what are some of those ideas around uh, making parking sustainable or, as you said, you know, uh, making it part, uh, a more elegant solution? What are, what are the ideas that you guys are talking about? Um, so we talk about a lot of the same things that, say, a LEED framework would um, with the United States Green Building Council or Green Globes, the existing conversations that are out there. So we talk about energy use, of course. Um, and how can we be more energy efficient to save energy? Um, we talk about water use. How can we make sure, and again, different, different depending on region, okay? People in Phoenix and California are very keen on how to save water um, in particular, and other places are, are less so. Um, but we talk about water, and how do you make sure that you're conserving water and processing water in a sustainable way? Um, so we're talking about very big picture issues. Um, also, in particular, integrating renewable energy. Parking is actually a terrific platform for solar and wind. Um, and so we're looking at exploring that. How can you do that on a greater scale? Um, again, regionally, it, it varies very much um, depending on the incentives for solar. Um, but it's part of that, that solution that we're talking about. So that's the big picture issues. That where you might even be more interested is in the technology. Um, so it's great to have energy efficiency measures. Okay, I save 60% on my electric bill, I save the resulting carbon emissions, great, terrific outcome. Okay, let's do that. Um, but the really big impacts come when you take individual efforts like energy efficiency and pair them with other efforts that have synergy with them. So if you're talking about energy efficiency, you wanna be talking about commissioning or recommissioning or retro commissioning your building. So this is pretty new for the parking industry. It's just something that, you know, LEED brought to the forefront by mandating it um, for their rating systems. So we're including that now. When you pair energy efficiency and commissioning with a lighting upgrade, that's even better because you're installing more energy efficient fixtures that need less maintenance, that last longer, and basically taking um, a more long-term view of your structure, not just, okay, energy efficiency and my next bill. Um, so those synergistic technologies and strategies, when you really start to pair them up, that's when you see the maximum impact. Um, and it, you know, it can go on and on. You can add solar to that equation. You can add electric vehicle charging to that equation. Um, but often it's just looked at as 
independent technology. So you hear a lot about electric vehicles. Well, mm -hmm. my first question is when you say, okay, you put an EV charger in your facility, are you plugging that into the wall to coal power? Because that's not the best solution. The best solution is to connect to a cleaner source of power. So we're trying to make all those connections and then using the technology to do that too. And you mentioned, you mentioned water a little bit ago. How does water and parking relate to one another? Um, well, it depends on where you are regionally. Um, I'm in the Philadelphia market. So, for example, we have a combined sewer and stormwater system, very, very old um, system. So what happens is when that system is at capacity, those flows can combine. <laughs> so um, Philadelphia is very keen on green infrastructure, meaning um, green streets, green roofs, anything that's, you know, siphoning water and are naturally filtering water and not putting into the storm and sewer system. Um, so we have a big push for green infrastructure in Philadelphia. So we have a couple of structures in the area that have green roof um, technologies. We have a couple, and this is not on a parking structure, but on a new residential development, we have a blue roof, a couple of blue roofs in the city to process storm water. So we're looking at making those connections with parking too. Um, so whereas people are already making the connection between solar and parking as a platform, we're looking at water too. But there's another area that we're looking at water. That's in, essentially in promoting natural infiltration. So that's good. That's a great practice, right? We're also looking at how we process water in a facility. So traditionally, most facilities will perform a quote-unquote washdown in their parking garage to keep their decks and their walls clean. And it's an essential part of maintaining the structure for the long term, which is also sustainable, right? Making the garage or any facility last as long as possible in as best condition as possible. So you do these washdowns. Well, how, where does that water come from? And where does that water go? And are you processing that water properly? Obviously beyond code. Obviously we want people to be, be living up to code at the barest of minimums. But when you're thinking about it, can you use recycled gray water, rainwater, some other source for that washdown? And are you being as environmentally careful as you can in disposing of that water as well? So there are issues that are unique to parking garages, and that's, that's one of those examples. It's a washdown. So those are the kind of things that your average, say, person who's running a parking facility may not be thinking about. Mm -hmm. So it's our goal to draw awareness to that issue, especially about, about water in that, in that field. So with the book, are you guys talking specifically about garages, or do you look at things like um, the, the smart parking apps that will send you a, a, an alert when, say, you're in downtown some city that the mm -hmm. street side parking space is available? Mm -hmm. So we're looking not only at parking garages, but we're looking at lots, too. Um, uh, we have a, I think the chapter is called Greening the Surface, um, making sure that we understand that every facility uh, is not a structured parking deck with a 1,000 spaces. Sometimes it's a 200-space lot. Sometimes they're on street meters. Um, so the focus of the book is really about garages and lots, but we have a chapter dedicated to on-street um, and parking operations and management because that's critically important as well. Um, your technologies and your apps are directing drivers to spaces more quickly, um, saving carbon emissions and, and fuel use, and of course time, which is important as well. So by using those apps, and, and there are a ton of them, you know, there are the parking guidance systems within the facilities. There are the wayfinding systems um, that are app applications. There are the uh, mobile payment systems, you know, that save time and, and paper and all those kinds of resources too. So we're looking at those technologies and those applications as an essential part of the solution. Are there one or two places in particular that you would you could call out that are really sort of ahead of the game on on sustainable parking? Absolutely. Um, I'm thinking that one of the facilities that, and there's, there's a series of case studies in the book, because we know that it's important to say how to do things and, and to teach people what are the best practices and to explore pushing boundaries to make these facilities or operations more sustainable. And that's, that's critically important, um, the didactic sort of section of the book on best practices. But what's really exciting about the book are, are the case studies. Um, focusing on how did somebody actually get there. It's great, tell me how to do it, but tell me how you did it is much more powerful. These are the challenges, this is what we did to overcome them, this is the ROI, right? So within that case study chapter, which is really quite hefty, 
Um, there are a number of examples, and any one of them is great to pull. Um, but Canopy, um, uh, Canopy Parking is out at Denver International Airport. Uh-huh. It's actually not a parking structure. It is a um, valet service and covered parking lot off airport parking facility. Um, that facility, um, which does include a building and a lobby, um, so it could be LEED certified, achieve both LEED certification as well as certified green garage beta status um, with the Green Parking Council. So they're looking at multiple rating systems and benchmarking themselves against all of them. Um, they had some great numbers in terms of waste reduction, um, energy production, programming, free electric vehicle charging, as well as a very just high level of service. So you're talking about sustainability at, at that facility in particular, people, planet, profit. Yes, we're talking about planet. We're using lead. We're benchmarking. We're reducing waste. We're, we're producing renewable energy. Great. People, we're talking about a much higher level of service that people will choose to go there because it's one of the better options. And and. People plan a profit, okay? So they're, they need to turn a profit. Anything that's truly sustainable has to be sustainable in the long term. So you're looking at the connections between all those three areas. So I would, I would highlight Canopy. Um, so Canopy is a great example. The another facility that I would call out is the Casino Reinvestment Development Agency's parking structure in Atlantic City, New Jersey. So CRDA is the acronym. They, when they designed the structure, again, this is a couple of years back, it was before parking structures were really trying to apply the LEED certification model. But they definitely made the right choice in a number of areas. They made sustainable choices in a time before it was sort of in vogue <laughs> in the parking industry. Um, so they have a full PV array on the roof. They have electric vehicle um, stations in the back. They have, again, beautiful architecture. And that's important to make that connection too. As, as parking garages evolve, and the architecture of parking garages evolve, being a good neighbor, having tremendous architecture, yes, even on a parking garage, makes a neighborhood better, makes it more walkable. People are more red- readily you know, able to be in the area and enjoy that space. So they have retail at grade. So what's exciting about that, that project, and this didn't even make the book because it's newer than that, is that um, one of the uni- colleges um, in New Jersey has opened um, an art center in the retail along the base of that facility. So not only do they have active retail space um, where they have classes and artist studios and gallery space, but they're actually doing art exhibitions that are not only inside the building but take place outside the building too. What a terrific evolution of something that used to be just something to park your car. So it becomes a good neighbor. So beyond just the technology, obviously the solar is great, the EV is great, but looking at people and how people interact in a space is an essential part of that solution too. What are some of the things, uh, you know, lessons or takeaways or, or the things that are most important to know about sustainable parking from, uh, from a, like a city manager or a mayoral point of view mm-hmm. that uh, maybe they're not thinking about right yeah. now? So sometimes... Um, the most convenient choice is not the sustainable choice. Sure. Um, the go-to answer, okay, we, are, we have zoned this mixed-use development, okay? And per zoning code, maybe there are parking minimums that dictate that we build a 1,000 spaces by code, okay? But if you actually look at the kind of development that it is, a couple of things can happen that make that more sustainable. And we do talk about this in the book, and this is one of the key takeaways that I would love for city officials, municipal folks to to understand, is that there are three of the most sustainable things you can do with parking. Make sure that you price it appropriately. Make sure that you're sharing spaces, which I'll go back and talk about shared parking in a minute. And then that placemaking piece, like I talked about, you know, with architecture and retail and all those kinds of walkability factors. The simple fact is that parking is not free. It is often offered as a free good, but it is always subsidized. It costs money to build. It costs money to maintain. Obviously, that's more expensive in a structure than it is, you know, say, in a, in a parking lot. But it is an expensive good, and it should be seen as that. It's a very small piece of real estate, right? You wouldn't live in a home for free. You're occupying a certain amount of space. So parking pricing is one of the most sustainable things you can do because you're for, you are making, people are making a choice 
do I want to pay $10 for parking today at work, or do I want to take the train for $8? When parking is provided for free, the choice, you know, is made already in many cases. So looking at pricing as a decision-making tool, um, which, again, uh, TDM is Transportation Demand Management. These folks have been talking about this for ages, parking pricing as a sustainability tool. So that's the first thing that I would say. So city and municipal officials can think about that in the way that they price their parking and the way that they, they do that. Going back to the example of zoning, um, say in a mixed-use development or a transit-oriented development, uh, parking consultants can perform something called a shared parking analysis. And what that means is that based on the mix of uses, you can have more turnover in a parking space. We don't want a parking space to be used one time a day. We want a parking space to be used by multiple users. So right. the perfect example is the commuter comes in and parks during the day. Commuter goes home, and then maybe there's a residence right there, and a resident parks in it twice. The greenest space is the space that is never constructed because you are maximizing the use of that real estate. So shared parking, as it's a very... Um, it's a well-developed product. It's a well-developed service that people understand. It works in real life. There are tons of examples of it. But very often, city and municipal officials need to make that leap from this is the zoning. The zoning requires 1,000. The parking professional comes in and says, you can build 750 instead of 1,000, which saves on transportation impacts, it saves on materials impacts, and the cost of the structure, which makes the development more financially feasible. Considering shared parking is quite possibly the number one recommendation that I would um, would offer uh, to that audience in particular. So it sounds like a, a really interesting book that actually has, theoretically, a lot broader appeal to people than just those in the, the parking industry. Absolutely. I, I mean, that's the thing. When when I got into this business, I don't know, 11 years ago, I, I worked for a design firm, Tim Haas, and I said, you only design parking structures. That's it. And Tim Haas is our president, and he said, yeah, that's what we do. We design parking and mixed-use structures, and he said, for airports, for hospitals, for cities, for train stations, for residential properties, and I was like, and for universities, and I thought, oh, wow, for government right? That's a pretty big market. The parking industry is really quite large, but it overlaps in so many different other sectors that this book actually has great appeal for a city or municipal official, for a university, for a hospital, for any one of those sectors. There's an awful lot in here about how to run parking and transportation in a better way. Um, so I, I certainly believe that this book has a tremendous amount of substance, um, and I and I would hope that people enjoy it. So and get a lot out of it. So the, when will it be available, and where can people get it? Um, it is actually available online now. It'll be available in both hard copy and electronic editions. Um, the electronic edition is actually available online now at Amazon. Uh, the hard copy we're taking pre-orders now will be available early June. So you can pre-order the book and then and then have it sent to you. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks. For Future Structure, I'm Chad Vanderveen. Follow us on Twitter at FutureStruck, like Thunderstruck, and visit us at FutureStructure.com.